Hello, and welcome to ETF.com's webinar, How ETFs Have and Will Change Portfolio Investing. I'm Rebecca Hampson, European Editor of ETF.com, and I'm joined today by Matt Hogan, who is President of Analytics and Publications at ETF.com, and Alan Miller, Founding Partner and CIO of SCM Private. Today's webinar is going to focus on what an ETF is, how it works on a day-to-day -day basis, how to choose the right ETF and ETFs in portfolios. We will also talk about how an ETF differs from a mutual fund, and we will examine some of the pitfalls that come with ETFs and what to look out for when buying them. Before I start, I'd like to remind you all that you can submit questions during the webinar through the text box in the bottom right of the screen, and there will be a question and answer session later on with the panelists. Now, the term ETF is likely to be something many of you will be familiar with, and for those of you who aren't, it can be considered a type of mutual fund that is changing the way investors invest. They offer big or small investors access to virtually every corner of the market and the ability to build institutional caliber portfolios with greater transparency at lower cost. Before I launch into talking about what an ETF is and how it works, I want to take you through the beginnings of the European ETF market. In Europe, the first ETFs were launched on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in April 2000 by Merrill Lynch. And this was quickly followed on April the 28th by iShares, who launched the FTSE 100 ETF on the London Stock Exchange. And from there, we've seen synthetic ETFs, bond ETFs, commodity exchange traded funds, and more. And as you can see from this slide, from humble beginnings in 2000, when there were five ETFs listed in Europe with assets of $1 million, there has been enormous growth, resulting in assets of $395 billion and 1,377 ETFs at the end of last year. And if you add in exchange-traded products, it gets even bigger, with $418 billion in assets. Exchange-traded products, which does include ETFs, is an umbrella term which includes products that have similarities to ETFs in the way they trade and settle but they don't use a mutual fund structure. For example, exchange-traded notes and exchange-traded commodities are not considered ETFs for re regulatory purposes. They also don't garner the same protection for investors that ETFs have. ETFs get extra security from the European Funds Regulation in the form of UCITS, and we'll cover this at a later date. In fact, when you compare the European ETP market to ETFs, it looks a little bit like this. And as you can see, it's a vast playground with many participants. So while we can see that ETFs make up the majority of assets in the ETP space, it's also useful to look at how they stand up in the mutual fund space. As you can see here, assets in the European mutual fund space are huge, huge. Uh, and measured to the end of the third quarter last year, they'd hit $8.95 trillion. Um, but you'll also notice that last year was the first time assets got back to the highs of anything like 2007. And this is in stark contrast to the ETF market, which has continued growing rapidly. And I remind you of this slide again. So what's the percentage of ETF assets in the mutual fund space? Well, this is what it looks like. And it's been rising from 1.5% in 2008 to 4.1% at the end of the third quarter last year. And it's only likely to continue growing. In the US, where the US ETF market is more established and ETFs have been used for longer, the ETF is revolutionizing investing. There's nearly $1 trillion in the US, and while it's still only a small part of the mutual fund industry, ETFs can now represent up to 30% of the traded daily volume on exchange. So what is it that makes ETFs so special? Well, here are a few reasons why. There's low cost, tax benefits, intraday trading, so you can get in and out of markets, transparency, and access to pretty much anything. And we will cover these as we go along. But firstly, it's more important to understand how an ETF actually works. And to do this, it helps to go back to how a mutual fund is set up. An ETF, for all intents and purposes, is a mutual fund. But it has some very special added extras. Like a mutual fund, it is still a structured pool of assets. It has a manager managing the assets in the fund. And it's regulated like a mutual fund. The added bonus, it's exchange traded. It can be bought and sold on exchange like a regular stock. And whereas a mutual fund can buy and sell stock, it can only do this once a day. An ETF can trade any time throughout the day, and the trade is immediate. This means you can get in and out of any market when you want to. So how does the mutual fund work exactly? Let's take the example that you and three of your friends have £10,000 you want to invest. 
you don't have the time or the expertise to manage the money yourself, and it's hard to build a diversified portfolio with only £10,000. So you all come together, pooling your money, creating a mutual fund. Mutual, because you're all invested. But it also means you've now got £40,000 to play with. And at this point, you're going to want to hire someone who does have the time and the expertise to invest it for you. So you hire a professional money manager to invest the full 40000 in the market for you. They are responsible for who invested what, and in return for the investment, each of you receives shares, representing your stake in the total investment. As you can see, you get 100 shares worth £100 each, which has results in your £10,000 initial investment. Now, assuming your manager does a good job, and after a certain period of time, they double your money, and you've got £80,000. And each share of that mutual fund is now worth £200. What do you do if you want to realize some of this money? It's at this point that you can redeem your shares. This is done by the fund manager going into the market and selling stocks worth £20,000 in order to pay you. Equally, if another investor wants to come into the market, they can by buying. But at this point, they will have to buy £200 worth of share, unlike earlier when you invested 100 They then follow the same practice as before by giving their money to the fund manager, who then puts that money to work. It works nicely as the fund manager is paid a fee for their efforts, and the investor gets the exposure they need. In practice, how does this work? Investors buy shares in existing mutual funds. This means that at some point during the day, the fund manager will place a buy order, and they will do this by sending a check to the mutual fund company or placing an order through a brokerage account, for example. In a mutual fund, this process of taking orders happens once a day. No matter when you decide you want to get in or out of the market, it's always done after close to trade at 4 p.m. Once the fund manager receives the money, they will return equal value of shares in the mutual fund. The price of each share is variable and determined by the end-of-day price, which is known as the net asset value. This value is calculated by dividing the value of the stocks, or bonds, or cash in your mutual fund, by the number of existing shares in the fund. The number of shares you receive is therefore based on the NAV, the net asset value, and you can even get fractional shares as you put in an exact cash amount of the fund, not a specific number of shares. But the thing to remember here is that the value of the fund, or the shares you hold, will be based on the end-of-day NAV price rather than when you decided to act, which could have been, say, at 11 a.m. that day. An ETF works differently. When you want to buy shares in an ETF, you just enter a buy order through your brokerage account or platform, like you would a regular stock. This can be placed at the market price or a limit price, which are the price you've chosen to wait for. The broker then goes into the market and gets the shares, pays the price for you, and delivers you your shares. The difference with the ETF is that you don't pay the mutual fund company directly. You pay the broker, which eliminates a whole heap of administration. And as with any regular stock, you are then able to go into the market to buy stock from someone who wants to sell, exactly when you want to, not at 4 p.m., so where does the ETF come from, and how does it come into being? Well, if you think back to your mutual fund, the first shares are created by the fund manager taking money into the market and buying stocks. The problem with starting an ETF is that you have to be able to buy and sell shares. But how can you buy the first shares? Well, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. The answer is that there's a group of institutional investors called authorized participants, or APs who are authorized to create shares of an ETF. Before an ETF launches, one of these APs will enter into an agreement to create a basket of ETF shares, typically 100,000 shares priced at $25 each. Rather than sending the ETF company $2.5 million in cash and requiring it to buy the securities, the APs will go out into the market and buy up all the individual securities that an ETF wants to hold. If, for example, this is an S&P 500 ETF, it will buy up all the individual stocks in the S&P and then ship those to the ETF company in exchange for shares. With the S&P 500 ETF, the AP who wants to create new shares will buy up $2.5 million of the stocks making up to the S&P 500. He will make those purchases in exactly the right percentages to track the index. So if a certain stock has a weighting worth 1%, then the AP will buy $25,000 of that stock. 
And once everything is brought up in all the right proportions, it is then submitted to the ETF company. For example, your iShares or your Vanguard or your Lexor. And in exchange, the ETF company creates an equal value of ETF shares and gives them to the AP on a one-to-one -one trade. The trade works pretty nicely as the ETF provider gets it needs to track the index and the AP gets the ETF shares he needs to sell in the open market. And this exchange continues on an ongoing base basis throughout the life of the ETF. Now as an individual investor, you don't need to worry about this. It happens in the background when you want to buy or sell shares and you can just go through your brokerage. But it is this creation and redemption process that arguably makes ETFs as good as they are. Thanks, Rebecca. I think that's a, a great overview. Uh, this is Matt Hogan from ETF.com. I just want to add a bit about why people are APs and then talk about how this creation redemption process drives some of the benefits as well as some of the risks uh, that are inherent to ETFs. So briefly, you know, why do these APs exist? And the answer to that is pretty simple. Uh, they exist to make money. So if you imagine the sort of base state of where ETFs exist, the ETF share price should be trading in line with the fair value of the securities it holds. So on this slide, you can see the ETF share is priced at £2.50, and the securities it holds are priced at £2.50. This is great. This is what you want. But what if there's a large buy order for the ETF shares? What if someone comes in with a million share buy order? Well, for a brief moment, if they don't know how to execute that trade very well, the price of the ETF shares may trade ahead of the value of the securities it holds. So here you can see that the price has risen to £2.60. Well, the securities are still £2.50. This is where the authorized participant comes into play. Seeing that the ETF share prices are overvalued, the authorized participant will buy up the securities in the underlying basket and turn them into the ETF issuer in exchange for shares priced at fair value. They'll then sell those ETF shares on the market because they're overvalued, buying the underlying, and making a nice arbitrage profit. As a result, the ETF share price will snap back in line with the fair value of the underlying securities, and the AP will walk off uh, with a small profit. The same thing works in reverse. If there's a massive sell order on the market, someone sells, say, a million shares of the ETF, that ETF share price can drop below the fair value of its securities for a brief moment. And again, the AP jumps on this opportunity, seeing the ETF shares priced at £2.40 when the securities are £2.50. They'll jump in, buy a million shares of those ETFs, trade them into the ETF issuer, and they'll get the underlying holdings at fair value, which they can sell on the open market to realize that arbitrage profit. Again, that will push up the value of the ETF shares, push down the value of the underlying securities, and bring everything back into uh, its equilibrium. And that's the mechanism that keeps ETFs priced fairly on the market, that allows you to have confidence that when you buy an ETF share, it's generally worth um, what, it's, what it's trading for, because these APs are always there to arbitrage away any uh, irrational pricing that may appear for an instant. So let's talk about how that ties into the core benefits of ETFs that people love to talk about. The first one, of course, is intraday trading. ETFs have become phenomenal trading vehicles. They, they trade all day long. They're a significant portion, over 25% of the value traded in the US and a growing portion in Europe. And why is that? Well because the creation redemption price keeps ETF prices fair. Right? Compared to mutual funds, which trade only once a day, they don't have an option. Compared to traditional closed-end funds, which can trade to premiums and discounts for sustained periods, you can't trust that you're getting a fair value. But in the ETF space, because of this creation redemption facility, you know that the ETF shares typically will be worth what they say they're worth. And that has made them great trading vehicles, um, and you see that in the volumes on the exchange. Uh, 
here's an example of SPY, certainly the most liquid security in the world, tracking the S&P 500 index. And you can see barely, if you look very closely, there are actually two lines on this chart. Blue is the price of SPY. Green is what's called the indicative value, which is the value of the underlying securities. And you can see that those two trade within a hair's breadth of each other uh, at any given moment. So this, this arbitrage mechanism does work, and it's what's contributed to the trading uh, beauty that ETFs represent. Lower costs are another big factor. The core answer about lower costs, everyone talks about how ETFs are low-cost instruments, is that ETFs are simply cheaper to run than competing uh, products, including mutual funds. And there's reasons for that. If you think back to how that creation redemption process works, in a traditional mutual fund, a mutual fund will have thousands and thousands of different shareholders. And it has to record who those shareholders are and process the record keeping and send them documents. In the ETF structure, all of that trading takes place on exchange or through your platform. So the ETF has much lower overhead costs. It's also cheaper for ETFs to acquire securities. When you buy shares in a mutual fund, you send them cash, which they have to hire people to go out into the market and acquire securities for. In a traditional ETF, typically the ETF will receive those, those creations in kind. In other words, the APs do the work of buying all the securities that an ETF wants to hold and then selling all the securities an ETF wants to get rid of. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it is fundamentally true that ETFs are easier to run than mutual funds. And as a result, they cost fund companies less, and they pass that on to shareholders as well in the form of lower TERs. Benefit number three, I think, part of that is that they cut out the distribution costs that you see with traditional mutual funds. Certainly, in, the, in, in a lot of the world, there are trail fees associated with mutual funds when they're put onto various platforms. Um, but because ETFs are available on exchange directly, um, it cuts out the middleman, and you typically don't have to pay um, those sort of trail fees, which, again, brings down the total cost. Tax efficiency is another big bet. Uh, ETFs certainly fit into the tax-deferred savings accounts in ISAs and self-invested pensions. And from April, UK purchases of ETFs will be exempt from stamp duty as well. So the tax efficiency of ETFs, already fairly good, is moving up even greater um, in, the, in the months to come. Transparency is another very important thing. Mutual funds typically only disclose their portfolios on a quarterly basis. Whereas with an ETF, you can actually look on most ETF issuers' websites and get their holdings not quarterly or monthly or semi-annually, but every single day. And knowing what you own gives you confidence that the ETF is doing what it says it does. Um, it's the way the market should work in today's era of big data and the sort of legacy of semi-annual disclosure, um, I think is something that should be left in the past. At number five is simply access. There are over 2,000 ETPs as of January 2014. That number continues to grow. And ETFs offer access to everything from FTSE 100 and S&P 500 to narrow niche markets, including commodities, currencies, various slivers of the fixed income market, even alternatives, levered, inverse, and other complex areas. So they really have put all these institutional style tools at the, the fingertips of investors um, and anyone who can access them through their platform or brokerage account. So ETFs are great. You can see here the breakdown of the availability of ETFs and how they've covered literally every corner of the market, uh, over 860 equity ETFs stretching from here to China to Vietnam and more. And you can get access basically anywhere, again, with all those benefits of low cost, intraday liquidity, and more. I do think before I turn it over to Alan, there are some issues with ETFs that bear mentioning. So some of these great benefits we talked to have a dark side. 
to them that investors should be aware of, right? So here's an example from the U.S. This is a S&P 500 equal weighted ETF during the so-called flash crash that we experienced in 2010. And you can see here that the ETF was trading along its merry way at $41.25. And when we had the sort of algorithmic failure on the New York Stock Exchange, it traded all the way down to zero. Now, that's a bit frightening if you were watching the screen. It's worth noting that if you had had a mutual fund in this same market, you would not have experienced the flash crash at all. They price only once a day. And so by the end of the day, this flash crash experience was cleared up. The problem for investors, you get the benefits of intraday liquidity. But that means you're exposed to the idiosyncrasies of intraday liquidity as well. And if you panicked during this fall, um, during this flash crash, you might have sold out at a level well below the fair value that this ETF was. Mutual fund investors don't have to deal with that. So the price for intraday liquidity is the complexity of intraday liquidity. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Another issue are commissions, right? Every transaction has a cost that you have to pay. Uh, in the mutual fund space, that's not always true. So investors, particularly those making small, regular investments into ETFs, need to be very aware of the potential commission costs that they might pay. Another issue, even if you can avoid commissions or minimize them, are spreads. So ETFs can be very liquid and trade a penny wide or, or or less, or they can trade at massive spreads, 2, 3, 4%. And if you're paying 2, 3, or 4% to get into an ETF, you're more than obviating the benefits you got from a little lower total expense ratio. So I think it's worth paying attention to spreads and liquidity. I know we're going to be doing more on ETF trading in the, in the months to come here on ETF.com. But it's important to remember that when you get intraday liquidity, you have both commissions and spreads to worry about. Another issue is fair value. If you remember back to where I started uh, talking about how ETFs can temporarily swing out of line with their fair value, um, that's true. And most ETFs will snap back close to their fair value thanks to that arbitrage mechanism we talked about, but not all of them. And it's worth being aware that some of the more illiquid ETFs can trade at significant premiums or discounts for long periods of time. And it's worth considering if it's worth paying that premium or discount to get in and out. This is particularly of concern, perhaps, in the bond markets, which aren't as liquid as the equity markets. And you can have persistent premiums and discounts uh, if investors are entering or exiting those markets in mass. I think the third issue, tax treatment, certainly things to look out for. The capital gains tax, if you buy with UK funds reporting status, you can benefit from the lower capital gains tax. Otherwise, you will be paying the income tax on ETFs. The country of issue can be important. You have to be aware of the withholding tax if your ETF was issued in France or in the US. And the corporation tax, uh, tax certainly UK domiciled ETFs, are liable for corporation tax on non-UK dividends. So the tax efficiency argument has to be handled carefully, and you have to understand what funds you are buying before you jump in. Last but not least, and perhaps most importantly from my point of view, there are over 2,000 ETFs out there. And though they claim and most people assume that a plain vanilla ETF is a plain vanilla ETF, and that one, say, biotech ETF is equivalent to the other, there's been a huge amount of index innovation uh, in this space over the last few years. And you can get wide variances in performance. So these charts are from the US, but you have the same experience over in Europe. These are four biotech ETFs. They all claim to provide exposure to the biotech space. And you can see over the course of this one year period, there is a 27% difference in return. You can't assume simply because an ETF says it's a biotech or an automobile or a China or a Vietnamese ETF that it's actually giving you quite the exposure you want. You have to dig in under the surface and make sure that you're getting exactly what you want because 27% in a single year is quite a massive difference. This is another example. These are three so-called BRIC ETFs in the U US. We all know 
BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But if you dig under the sur surface of these ETFs, you can see that their actual exposures are markedly different. Look at that bottom line, EEB. That's an ETF that had over a billion dollars invested in it. And you can see it only had 2% exposure to Russia. And it was massively overweight Brazil compared to its peers. Now, if you're looking for a BRIC ETF and you buy one that doesn't have any exposure to Russia, you're getting a BIC ETF, not a BRIC ETF. And you should understand that. So again, it pays to take just a minute, it's not hard, to dig under the surface and look at what an ETF actually holds and make sure that it aligns with what you actually want. My last bit before I turn it over to Alan is some complex ETF issues. So ETFs I mentioned have opened up wonderful areas of the market like commodities, um, like alternatives, and like levered and inverse. And they can be very powerful tools. But you have to understand that some of these areas of the market, which you can now access through a brokerage account, may not be as plain vanilla as you think. So on this chart, there's three lines. If I can have you look first at the light purple line in the middle, that's the return of the Russell Financial Services Index. And you can see over the course of this year, it ended the year up about 11%. The dark purple line is actually an, an ETF designed to provide three times the return of the Russell Financial Index. Now, you might assume that if the base index was up 11%, this ETF would be up 33%. But you can see it's actually only up 13%. The green line is designed to deliver negative three times the return of the Russell Financial Index. And a naive assumption might say if one index was up 11%, a naive negative three-time return would be down 33%. In fact, this ETF ended the year down 51%, 18% worse than your naive assumption may have made. So what's going on here? There's actually not a problem with these ETFs and how they're run. They're doing exactly what they say they do. The problem is that they are designed to deliver three times or negative three times the return of an index over a one-day period. And though that sounds great, if you do the math, you'll see that you can quickly get out of whack. So if you have an index that it starts at 100 and an ETF designed to deliver negative two times the return of that index, if on day one the index goes up 10% from 100 to 110, the ETF will fall 20% from 100 to 80. You see that the ETF has done its job just perfectly. On day two, if the index falls 10%, 10% of 110 is 11, so that brings it down from 110 to 99. The ETF will do just what it says it does. It will rise 20%. 20% of 80, of course, is 16, so it rises from 80 to 96. But now you're in a curious situation where though the ETF has delivered exactly on its promise, after two days, the index is down 1%. And your negative 200% ETF, which you might have assumed would be up 2%, is actually down 4%. This is the path dependency of daily compounding returns. Again, the ETF has done nothing wrong, but your return is upside down because it's a daily rebalance. All this means is that when you get into more complex ETFs, you need to take the time to understand what it is you're buying. If you're buying an oil ETF, understand you won't get the spot price of oil, but rather something tied to oil futures. If you're buying levered and inverse ETFs, understand that the one-day return does not translate into two or three times the long-term return. And that's about it for me. I think at this point, I want to turn it over to Alan, founding partner and CIO of SCM Private, to talk a little bit about how he uses ETFs in his portfolio and why he finds them to be uh, valuable tools. Alan, go ahead. OK, th thank you, Matt. Um, I mean, much of uh, what I'm about to cover has already been covered by your slides. So I'll, I'll go quickly through what's already been covered. but. Um, I think that's an excellent summary there, Matt. So on the on the next slide, um, in terms of what are if somebody could progress the next slide, um, in terms of what are ETFs, um, everybody thinks of them as um, somehow complicated, but actually, in essence, they're really just unit trusts 
but uh, in terms of structure or usage funds, but you can actually buy or sell them on the exchange with all the benefits that uh, Matt and Rebecca have talked about. So they really are, it, blend, if you like, the benefits of owning shares with the benefits of owning uh, pooled funds. Um, sorry, is, um, is the right slide on, on mine? Um, so if we go on to the, the um, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of talk uh, about ETFs being dangerous. Um, but actually, uh, if you actually think of what has actually happened since they've started, there's never been a single ETF that's been either um, suspended in any way or um, had been um, with investors kind of losing, losing money. Uh, whereas there's been quite a few um, mutual funds o over many years, for example, many of the large property funds in the UK, where they had to be suspended for long periods of time because when there was a sudden uh, rush to the door for people um, wanting to sell out, there simply wasn't liquidity there. So the huge benefit that ETFs have in that you've got a secondary liquidity source in terms of people making prices is a huge benefit to investors. Um, if somebody can click on the next slide, um, why use an ETF over other index funds? Um, as Matt said, one of the huge advantages of ETFs is cutting out all, a lot of the layers. And if you hold an ETF in a, in a very expensive way, then you're actually losing much of the benefits. So for example, in the UK, um, a lot of retail investors hold unit funds or ETFs through well-known platforms like Fidelity or Hargreaves. But actually, you can often hold those same ETFs far cheaper by just doing a bit of homework. For example, Hargreaves charges up to 0.45% uh, on top of the ETF charges to hold it. But you could, there's platforms like the, um, there's a, a platform run by um, Halifax called iWeb, where they just charge you a one-off uh, charge. So over the years, if you're holding your investments for a number of years, the savings can actually be immense. The other thing that Matt mentioned, which was um, knowing the price, this is a huge advantage when you buy or sell anything. Can you think of any other item in the world when you go into a shop where you don't actually know the price? So if you buy an ETF, you actually know the price. If you don't want to deal with that price, if you don't want to sell it or you don't want to buy it, that's your prerogative. But at least you're being told that price before you deal. Whereas if you buy a mutual fund, you won't know the price until after you bought it or after you sold it. Now that may work in your favor sometimes and that may work against you. But if you, if you think about the different prices, which um, as Matt talked about in terms of the net asset value of mutual funds, people think wrongly that because a lot of mutual funds may have one price, that there's no spread. There's always a spread, there's always a cost of buying and selling. But you can't see it. You don't know if you're buying a mutual fund, whether you're paying the middle price, the bid price, the offer price, the cancellation price, or the creation price. And as I said, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Whereas with ETFs, there's essentially a, a competitive situation with market makers trying to kind of compete with it, each other to, for your business, just as there's huge compet competition in terms of the number of providers for, for the big known indexes, which both of which drive down prices, so you as a consumer are the winner. And lastly, choice. I went to a, a, a conf ETF conference around the stock exchange, where one of the host slides actually said one of the big disadvantages of ETFs was that uh, the question was, where is the fee? So uh, the speaker wasn't happy that they didn't pay out large charges to other intermediaries. And secondly, it empowers the individual. The individual has the choice. There's 718 ETFs available in the UK, for example, which cover virtually every single asset. You can choose whether you want to hold government bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, emerging bonds, large companies, small companies. It's up to you. And in terms of building a portfolio, which is what a lot of investors want. One of the best ways to do it is via the ETFs because you can basically tailor the portfolio to whatever it is that suits you. And when you choose to buy an asset and replace it with another asset, you can do it both at the same time. So rather than say you decide that you want to sell 5% of your portfolio in Japan and put it into the US, 
If you do it via mutual funds, then you don't know what the price is going to be at 12 o'clock tomorrow when it's likely your mutual fund will deal. If you deal it on the share, you know the price of the share of the Japan fund and you know the price on the US fund. So it's a, it's a modern way of having your money managed and it's a modern way of building multi-asset portfolios. Um, so which then kind of goes on to the next slide, how to, how to filter. Well, Matt has mentioned um, the problems with uh, short or leveraged ETFs. And our view, our view is basically we avoid them completely. Um, we just think for people who want to hold their investments for a period of time, the odds are against you if you invest in a short or leveraged ETF because of this daily um, basis of which they're set. So we just avoid them completely. Uh, secondly, as again Matt said, the important thing anything is to actually understand what you're holding. So if, for example, you're uh, wanting to buy an emerging markets ETF, some of the indexes may differ. For example, the MSCI emerging markets um, includes um, Korea, whereas the FTSE emerging markets doesn't include Korea. So if, if you want to have exposure to Samsung, you want to hold the MSCI Emerging Markets Index rather than the FTSE Emerging Markets Index. Um, tax is an important one, particularly for the UK. Most ETFs these days do have reporting status. But if you do hold an ETF that doesn't have reporting status, you may find that your um, capital gain will be treated as income. And for most individuals, it tends to be the capital rate of capital gains tax is less than the income tax. So it's one of the most important things is to double check, go to the ETF manufacturer's website, double check you are buying an ETF that has reporting status. People think of ETFs in terms of the kind of the display charges, but you're actually buying them as a share. So you need to actually look at how much it's going to cost you to buy and sell that share. Part of that cost is how much you pay the middleman, which as I said before is very important to go to a low cost broker. But secondly, what the spread of the ETF is. So if you're dealing, for example, in FTSE 100, the spreads can be minute. You can have FTSE 100 ETFs where the spreads are a few, few basis points. If you're buying in a local currency emerging market debt to reflect the illiquidity of those uh, types of bonds, the spreads can be half to 1%. So in less liquid assets, you want to look very carefully at the spread because if you're holding that ETF for a short period of time, that's going to add substantially to your cost. Um, we talk about uh, structure and policies of the ETF. Um, th these days, the differences are, are much less than they have been. Virtually every single synthetic ETF tends to have 100% collateral on a daily basis and shows on their websites exactly what it's made up of, which tends to be very highly liquid um, government bonds and equities. And within the um, physical ETFs, whereas a year or two ago there used to be quite high levels of security lending, most ETF companies have substantially reduced that and put on quite st um, strong limits. So those differences actually are much less than they have been. So the most important thing which uh, people forget is actually, uh, next slide emphasis on what counts, is actually making sure in terms of whether you're buying one ETF or a portfolio of ETFs, which assets that you want to choose. 91% um, of returns, according to uh, various academics, actually come from which market you're in. It doesn't come from the, either the stock selection or the market timing. So rather than actually spend kind of all your time deciding whether you actually want to have um, the, the biotech or the uh, healthcare, the most important is do I want to ha how much do I want to have in equities, how much do I want to have in bonds or commodities, and then within that, which particular area do I want to invest in? Do I want to be across the world in the UK, US? Do I want to be in large cap? Do I want to be in small cap? These are asset allocation decisions. The actual once you've made that decision, it will then lead you into a relatively small number of ETFs. Uh, and you can then look at them quite closely in terms of their headline costs and their other costs like the spreads, and obviously the size and liquidity of each of those um, ETFs. So all in all, 
I mean, ETFs are an incredible um, basic technological advance, which have really transformed for many investors um, the way they invest more than if you think about the phone. It's almost the equivalent of comparing the mobile phone with the old phone, um, which you used to kind of move your finger around the dial and um, be attached to the, um, your hallway. Uh, these things are amazing, but with that power, which uh, the investor has, you have to be careful, you have to kind of do your homework, and you have to know what you're getting. And if you don't understand the ETF, and you don't understand the way it works and the, what it's investing in, the best thing to do is to avoid it. Uh, thank you. Alan, thanks awesome. very much for that. Yeah. That was really interesting. Um, I think I'm going to turn this over to um, a question and answer session now. Um, just to remind you all, um, you can ask questions um, via the text box in the bottom right of the screen. Um, the first one I have um, is, is from someone who says, from what we say, an ETF always tracks the corresponding index faithfully. So how does one make money then out of an ETF? Is it not better playing the underlying shares? Uh, now, I don't know whether Matt or Alan, if either of you want to take that. Um. How does one make money out of this? I mean, I, I think I can start, Alan, and, yeah, then, start. and then you can fill right okay. in. I mean, I, I think the core answer to that, um, it's a great question, um, but the core answer to that, of course, is that the vast majority of uh, market returns, as you said, Alan, are driven by your broad-based exposure to the market. And it's very uh, questionable whether um, selecting individual stocks uh, can lead to uh, better performance than buying the market as a whole. So, I mean, the short answer is you make money because over a long period of time, the market tends to go up. And I think you'd agree, Alan, that, you know, that academic research suggests that that's uh, a more efficient way to tackle the market and the number of people who can um, outperform by picking individual shares uh, is very few and, and very hard to find. I mean, there, there was research a few years ago from um, within at BlackRock, where they showed what the chance of an average fund manager beating the index three years on the trot, and the probability was 4%. So, I mean, whilst the, the, of course there are managers, and you'll, you'll see the names and you know the names who've, who've done well, now that doesn't guarantee they will continue doing well. Um, if you actually want to have something which is kind of, if you like, the odds are on your side, then it's really hard to beat an index fund. But of course, you always make higher returns from individual stocks or a very concentrated portfolio. The, the index fund, or most index funds, which tend to be much more well diversified, will tend to have kind of lower highs and lower lows than a, um, a concentrated active fund or individual stock picking. It's a question of what it is that suits investors. But if you think about the, the basic kind of law of maths, which I mean, uh, Bogle has talked about for years, if you think that all fund managers basically make up the market, and therefore half of them must be beating the market, essentially, and half of them must be um, not beating the market, the only difference in the performance over the long term must be the costs. You can't have uh, the marketing departments of the great fund managers claiming that you know they can all beat the market forever. It's mathematically impossible. So the question is, do you want to have the, the odds on your side or do you want to have the odds against? There's nothing wrong with buying a lottery ticket as long as you know you're buying a lottery ticket. Good answer. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the next question I've got is, what happens to the dividends distributed by the underlying holdings of, for example, an S&P 500 ETF? Are they reinvested back into the ETF or distributed to the ETF holders, or does the provider take it as part of their income in running the ETF? Um, well, actually, in most ETFs, they tend to be accumulating ETFs. There are some ETFs um, which are distributing. Uh, I mean, essentially, actually, sorry, the, most, most ETFs will distribute at regular points. So if you take something like a, an example of a UK FTSE 100 or an all share, uh, most ETF providers will probably pay out dividends twice a year based on the accumulation of the underlying dividends within the index. Within the bond ETFs, quite often they'll pay out more regularly, like quarterly. Um, 
I mean, to have reporting status, you have to, the rules are kind of quite strict on how much of the um, dividends have to be paid out, otherwise you don't uh, keep the reporting status with the HMRC in the UK anyway. So there's nobody keeping it, they're just kind of paid on. And the beauty of the ETFs, if you think about it, is you're actually receiving that index return. You might, you might be alternatively holding a mutual fund, and the mutual fund could be holding 10% in cash. So if, let's say the mutual fund is invested in the UK equities, and UK equities go up 10%. The index fund will go up 10% less the cost, whereas the mutual fund might have 10% in cash, and therefore you haven't really actually received 100% of the index return. You've received 90% plus or minus whether that fund manager has added or subtracted in terms of stock picking. Okay. Um, thanks, Alan, for that. Um, I've actually got another question for you here. Um, it's for you, and it says, are you able to comment on active managed ETFs? Oh, well, I see the most successful active managed ETF has been the PIMCO um, total return ETF in the, in the States. Um, it hasn't, I mean, it depends on your definition of active. There's been a lot of alternative beta ETFs um, have been brought to market over the last 12 or 24 months. Uh, within the UK, uh, we're the first to have launched a multi-asset ETF which actively manages the portfolio and changes the asset allocation. So instead of the investor having to, if you like, change the asset allocation themselves, it's changed within the ETF. And because you're, um, you've got one fixed price, that can be a, you know what the price you're paying rather than most fund of funds, you have two high levels of charges put together. I mean, I think, Active ETFs will definitely grow in size, and in the U.S., more fund management companies are changing to having a mutual fund and an ETF for the same fund, and eventually the same, normally what happens in the U.S. comes to the U.K., but often with a delay of five to ten years. So no doubt the same companies in the U.K., for example, who are very anti-ETF, will be in a few years' time launching exactly the same funds, but with a ETF wrapper because of all the benefits the ETF wrapper brings to the party. Right, and I, I, I'd just add into that, Rebecca. You know, in the U.S., Alan's right, we've seen success with Bill Gross and his total return bond ETF. I think it has 4 or $5 billion in assets. Um, but then again, that's Bill Gross. There are only so many Bill Grosses in the world. So there are a lot of companies lining up to launch actively managed uh, ETFs in the U.S., particularly if they can find a way to do it uh, without the daily transparency. A lot of active managers don't want to show their full portfolio on a daily basis, um, and there may be ways to allow that to happen uh, coming down the pike in a year or two. But I'm generally skeptical on the growth. I actually think Alan's on the cutting edge here, that what we're going to see is more actively managed portfolios that use ETFs to rotate between asset classes. I think the sort of era of stock picking um, has subsided a bit. Investors realize that asset class selection, uh, country selection, sector selection is more important than individual security selection. And um, I think you'll see more of the sort of ETF of ETFs uh, with active management between different countries or sectors, um, those will prove more successful than single stock picking in an ETF wrapper, although for sure, as Alan says, we'll see both. Thanks, Matt. That's really interesting. Um, the next question I've got is, um, is an ETF only as liquid or illiquid as the underlying? Um, and I'm going to hand that over to probably Matt. Well, that's a, that's, a good that's a very one. interesting <laughs> question. That, that's a very interesting question because um, there have been various ETF companies that have highlighted, but um, I think iShares have highlighted this year, a year or two ago, particularly in the space of corporate bonds, where actually because the ETF becomes a proxy, if you like, a more liquid proxy for that market than individual corporate bonds, then the ETF can actually gain an extra liquidity on top. And we've seen in the UK, particularly in the field of corporate bonds, which tend to be pretty illiquid, that um, quite a large number of the largest mutual fund corporate bond uh, funds um, have had to run with either large cash balances or with government bonds for fear of large redemptions. 
so that it's interesting that you can actually you can get more liquidity. Of course, if everybody's heading for the exit, then the spreads will increase. But then the alternative in the mutual fund world is how, how is it going to treat the investors leaving to the investors staying? Is it going to have to kind of suspend redemptions completely? Whereas you're going to still have a price. You might not like the price, but at least you have the benefit of having a price to buy or sell. Yeah, what well, Alan says is absolutely right. Uh, I call it super liquidity, and it certainly exists. So, um, you know, my expertise is in the U.S., where you take a small cap index, and if you actually bought all the securities in that index, it would cost you about 20 basis points in spreads. Um, whereas you can buy a small cap ETF that trades only one basis point wide, and you can trade significant volume in that. So, in illiquid markets like small caps, uh, like corporate bonds. Um, like municipal bonds in the U.S., it's often the case that the ETF is more liquid than its underlying. I will say that the flip side can also be true. So just because an ETF tracks a liquid market, it doesn't mean that if you go into your brokerage or your platform and you know rawly enter a market order for a large number of shares, you'll get a good execution. Um, if the ETF doesn't have much on-screen liquidity, you have to be careful in terms of how you trade it. Um, so ETFs are phenomenally liquid. In some cases, as Alan says, they can be more liquid than the underlying. Um, but for ETFs that don't trade a lot on exchange, if you're entering a small share order, uh, you do have to be careful. You at least have to understand how ETFs trade and, and perhaps how to partner uh, with a liquidity provider to get those ETFs priced uh, effectively. Well, that's really interesting, guys. Thanks very much. Um, so the next question I've got is, um, is the stamp duty removal on UK domiciled ETFs relevant, considering there are no ETFs domiciled in the UK? Um, now, I'll, I'll start off with this, and probably Anna, maybe hang, hand over to you, but this obviously came out um, last autumn in the, um, the, the when the Chancellor Lex Checker announced his budget. And he was saying, you know, there'll be no levy on stamp duty on ETFs, um, and the idea is to help boost the, the UK financial market. But of course, most of the European ETFs are domiciled in Ireland and Luxembourg. Um, and other than trying to bring money into the UK, I personally can't see why, how this will benefit ETFs in any way, um, other than benefiting the UK financial sector. So, I mean, is this relevant? Um, and yeah, I, it's probably more I, I agree with you. I said that at the time. I'm not sure what Mr. Osborne was smoking at the time, but I, I can't actually kind of <laughs> understand what the difference it made whatsoever, because as you say, such every single ETF uh, within, the U within the UK, for example, it tends to be um, domiciled in Luxembourg or, or Ireland. So, and it, in terms of the ETF manufacturers themselves, obviously they have a benefit in terms of their profitability, I would assume, from uh, being run in, in lower tax regions than the UK, and any benefit you know, which they get must make it more competitive and therefore drive down prices, which must be a good thing. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. Um, whilst we're on the, the tax the tax subjects, um, I mean, are you able to, can you explain the benefits of having an ETF, um, the ta what the tax benefits are for a UK investor? Because by my understanding, it's, it's not entirely clear. I mean, we don't have as many benefits as, we say, the US does. And... Um, you know, ETFs are as beneficial as mutual funds, which are obviously subject to CGT if they're um, mm. UK listed. I mean, well, I think in, the, in the UK, in the UK, is very little difference tax, tax wise between, of, you know, a reporting status ETF and a unit trust are, are essentially identical for tax reasons. Um, in the US, there seem to be much larger tax differences which can be beneficial for individual holders, which is maybe one of the reasons why um, a lot of investors have, have bought ETF, ETFs more in the States than they have in the UK, because there is a huge tax advantage within the US, which is now coming to people's kind of um, uh, personal pensions. A number of um, providers are now entering that via, via ETF. I don't know if Matt wants to say anything on that. Um, no, I mean, I... I, I, I I think I think that I think that covers it. Um, well, I think we have time for one last question, um, and I have a reasonably good one actually. Um, which is through Alan's view. Um, 
and the question is, like, how do you select the right ETF for you if there are, say, 15 ETFs tracking the FTSE 100 on the London Stock Exchange? And this is obviously a problem that's sort of Europe-wide. We have, you know, with more products than the US, um, and so many cross-listings across all the exchanges in Europe. But how, how do you choose? Well, I mean, just take that FTSE 100. Um, at the moment, there's, there's, there's two ETFs which um, charge... There's one big house that has an ETF that charges nine basis points, and another very large uh, ETF house that has an ETF charge ten. Whereas most of the other ETFs with the FTSE 100 are charging 20 to 30 basis points. So on the, you know, on the headline charge alone, even for something like the FTSE 100, where there are quite a number of ETFs, the difference there's a there's an easy decision there. And then if you if you go on from there, you look at the 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 spreads. Again, some of the FTSE 100 ETFs have larger spreads than others, but actually, if you choose, you know, something different to the ETF, to FTSE 100 or S&P 500 or MSCI Emerging Markets, the choice is much, much less in terms of numbers. So you're really choosing, as I said before, which asset and then which index. So whether you want to emerging markets, do you want to have minimum volatility? Do you want to have large cap, small cap? Do you want to have some kind of factor tilt? Um, do you want to have one specific emerging market or one theme within emerging markets? And once you've done that, the choice of ETFs will actually will virtually always be much less than 15 anyway. Right. I, I, I think that's right. I think Alan pointed to the key factors of costs. You should, of course, look at uh, tracking performance as well if you can, um, which gives a, a, an additive uh, view in addition to the headline cost um, and spreads. But uh, he's right, the bigger choice is not between a 9 basis point and a 10 basis point FTSE 100 ETF. Chances are both of those will be fine and you won't notice the difference. Um, the choice will be between um, you know, an emerging market ETF that tracks a FTSE index and one that tracks an MSCI index where you're talking about a 20% allocation to South Korea in one and not the other or between one of those and, as Alan said, a low volatility version where you're talking about very different portfolios. And it's those portfolio differences that lead to 5, 10, and 15% differences in performance. Um, once you get down to 9 or 10 basis points um, between costs, it's fun to cover that horse race. But practically speaking, it doesn't matter for investors much. Um, what really matters is those portfolio differences, which can be enormous even for ETFs that have the same name and appear to be similar on the surface. Thanks, Matt. That's great. Um, I've actually got one last very interesting question, um, which probably fits for both of you, uh, and I think it'll be the last one we have. But when will ETFs go to a discount or a premium? Um, and since they're open-ended, I think this is this is quite a good question. I mean, and is this dangerous for the investor? I mean, a few years ago, funny enough, we were invested in an ETF which was on a substantial premium after we invested in it. Uh, I'm not sure, Matt, you know the story of this one called the UNG Natural Gas ETF. And what happened, it was a very popular field at the time for people investing. And when the ETF company said it was, um, it was going to limit the size and not issue any more units, the people, the private investors carried on buying. And it went to, at one point, a 10 or 20% premium to its net asset value. So we we sold our uh, natural gas, and we bought it basically around the corner in another market, and we bought the same product 20% cheaper. Um, sometimes in ETFs will go to discounts, like uh, last year in emerging markets when there was that huge fallout. Um, a number of ETFs for a short period of time, particularly in emerging markets because of the huge uh, flow of people selling uh, went to reasonable um, discounts, but then you know that was you could either kind of just hold off or take an advantage to buy something when it was completely out of favour. Yeah, I think I think that's right. So yes, uh, Alan pointed to two two cases. Um, one where ETFs stop creating new shares when they're no longer really ETFs; they're closed end funds, um, and those can trade to sustain premiums and discounts and. Um, you should be as savvy as Alan and sell uh, when the premium gets to obscene levels. Um, yeah, and, and then on the discount side, um, you know, as, as Alan said, there are some markets, if bonds uh, 
uh, fall out of bed. Uh, bond ETFs can trade at least temporarily to short-term discounts. A lot of people think that's actually probably the fair clearing price, and mostly those mean revert as soon as normalcy returns to the market. I will make one caution, which is that there are a lot of false premiums and discounts in the market. So if you look at, for instance, a China ETF uh, during the day trading in London, you know, the, the ETF will trade up, down, sideways based on what's happening in the European markets. Its actual NAV won't move at all if it holds Chinese shares because the NAV is based on the last traded price on the local exchange. And then, you know, the, the Hong Kong market may have closed quite a while ago. So you'll see its NAV stay flat even as the fund trades to a premium or discount on a one-day basis based on what's going on in Europe. That's not real premiums and discounts, and that is mean reverting, and you needn't worry about that. Um, what you do need to worry about are the situations Alan mentioned where um, either the fund is broken and not doing creations or redemptions, um, in which case who knows where it will trade, and, and you should um, you know, trade out at a premium or, or buy potentially at a discount. Um, or there's a real dislocation in the markets, right, an emerging market panic, a bond panic, in which case you can get a short-term drop. Um, but generally speaking, you're well served if a fund happens like that to hold the course um, because those premiums and discounts tend to revert. But, um, you know, that takes a, a strong stomach to do that um, when all the headlines are negative. So that's what I'd say. I'd say watch out for those two things and ignore the daily premiums and discounts you see on internationally listed or internationally focused equity ETFs because those um, just are, are, are illusionary. Guys, thanks so much. I think on that note, we're going to wrap it up. I'd like to say a big thank you to Matt Hogan and Alan Miller. Um, you've been excellent panelists. I'd also like to say a big thank you to the audience and all attendees who listened. Um, just to let you know, the webinar will be on demand on our website um, within 24 hours. Um, and we will be hosting hopefully a few more this year, um, so be on the lookout for those.